Hello everyone, welcome to Wall Street for Main Street Podcast. My name is Mo Dawood, alongside Jason Barak, and today's uh, guest is a returning guest. We had him on a couple of times now, is Greg Manorino. Greg, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. I love being on you guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, Greg. Uh, this is Jason. Um, let's start with our first question right now. Um, nor- normally, uh, I don't hear a lot of other people interview you about your trading expertise and about high-frequency trading and algorithms. Uh, you trade a lot, uh, almost every day, I believe, right? Uh, how are high-frequency trading and algorithms affecting your trading? Well, well, I, I think, first of all, I think that high frequency traders or trading, they're they're more or less competing with each other. Do I believe that affects the retail investor or trader? It probably does through other mechanisms. I mean, I don't believe that this modality is without, um, uh, let's say, some dubious uh, uh, onbringings. Um, there's no doubt about that. And, and I write about this in my book that these high frequency traders do uh, and can manipulate asset prices um, through collusion. And there's no doubt about it. I think people know this. Um, But I I, I still think that this modality of trading, I mean, first of all, let's put this into perspective for people. I don't think people understand how immense this is. There there are some estimates that 50% of market liquidity is from high frequency trading. It's tremendous. What what would happen if this were not going on? Um, well, I we think it would be an interesting prospect to consider, but I think this is the norm despite what we're hearing. Um, you know, a lot of people want to do away with it, but I, I don't I don't I don't feel threatened as a a, a retail trader, retail investor. Um, you know, from these things, um, and and not all the time, not all. Uh, HFT um, trades are successful. I mean, they they do lose money too, uh, just as uh, the regular guy or the regular girl does. So I think that the main issue with high frequency trading is it's just so poorly understood, and people are are afraid of things that they don't get. Um, they think there's something clandestine going on, and and I personally, well, I can say this, <laughs> I can say with a relatively high degree of certainty that that there is collusion between institutions that are using these um, these platforms. And does that affect the market negatively? I'm, I'm sure that it does. But there's so much going on here. I mean, look at the distortions alone that are being created by the, the central bank here in the United States. So, I mean, this whole thing across the spectrum is um, is very dangerous. I mean, each, and like high frequency trading is just a part of it. Yeah, and I, I think those are great points, Greg. And I think some things about the high frequency trading is that it just creates enormous volatility, which for a pro trader like you, someone you know who's been through a lot of different types of markets, uh, who's you, who does it, who's made money on the long side and on the short side, and doesn't re- you know chases the uh, who uh, trades the trend. It, it's not a huge deal, and in fact, it's actually a good thing for a pro. You know, the more volatility, the better, right? But for oh, the re- but 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 for the retail investor, the long term buy and hold mom and pop type, or the retail trader who doesn't have access to this high, uh, for, you know, this fast equipment and stuff, you know, supercomputers and all these other things, they're not close to the exchange. They're getting the shaft. It seems to me like because you know their trades are being front run. Uh, these trades are pulling bids and asks. So you have the uh, on the level two quotes, you can see this. And these high frequency traders, they'll have these bids and asks in, and then they'll pull them out of the market. They're not supposed to be doing that. They're mm-hmm. trading with each other back and forth just to create, you know, fake volume. What a wash trade! They're front running each, uh, they're front running regular orders, and it just seems, you know, like it's just making things uh, less and less transparent. Absolutely, and that's that's what I was referring to earlier. And there's no doubt that this does go on. Everything that you're talking about. Uh, but, you know, again, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, just for myself, I mean, I don't feel threatened by these these things. And I, I think, you know, it's something you have to deal with as a trader and understand that, that, you know, a lot of things aren't what they seem. And that's what makes it so challenging to me, at least, and, and, and interesting at the same time. You know, um, I mean, I live and breathe this stuff, um, and that's a fact. 
So I, I think what people should take away from this, especially, you know, let's say the average guy, the average girl who, you know, doesn't have access to these things, but wants to get into, you know, finance and trading, you know, don't don't let that hold you back. But just realize that that does go on uh, manipulation and, and, and distortions and, you know, all kinds of funny things. But again, like you said, it does add to, you know, volatility to a certain degree and you can trade it. And, and you could make it work for you, too, uh, over the long run. And then that's a great point there. And then despite having high-frequency trading, uh, you can still make money trading in the stock market. You just uh, got to know what you're doing. Absolutely. You know, you're just going to dump your, your losers and ride your winners. And, you know, sometimes you'll have a whole bunch of losers in a row. I mean, that's just the way it is. Uh, it's not an easy business. Believe me, you guys know that uh, probably better than anybody. And if, if it were, more people would do it. you got to be in the right mindset. you got to be willing to take losses. You have to be willing to look at the big picture. And, and, uh, and, and that's that. And it's, that's why it's not for everyone. Uh, you know, I, I get hundreds and hundreds of emails every day uh, about people who want to enter this realm. And I do try to an- answer some of them. And I just say, you better be ready for the, for the ride of your life if you want to get into it. I mean, it's not... Uh, it definitely isn't something for the faint of heart, you know, getting into this business. Um, it's it, it's tough. And if anyone, anyone can say that it's not a tough business, well, they're just flat out lying. Uh, and that's a fact. Now, I want to talk about high frequency trading and technical analysis. Now, you, you do a lot of technical analysis, uh, maybe except for gold and silver market, which is getting extremely hard to predict because of the manipulation. Mm-hmm. But for regular stock, technical analysis can be uh, pretty useful for entry and exit points. Mm-hmm. And with the uh, you know the rise of high frequency trading, have you seen uh, has it become any harder or easier for you to trade, or has it been the same? No difference for you. Um, no, I don't. I don't think I don't really consider it too much. Like when I'm looking into a particular asset or maybe a whole index or whatever. Um, I just try to, you know, first of all, I think what people need to realize, you know, what really, what really is technical analysis? It's just, just a way of, of evaluating like an index or, or security, whatever you want, might be looking at, and just trying to gauge where it may go by looking at specific patterns and, and movements of price action and volume and a whole, a whole host of things. So it, that's another, it's very complicated as well. But I don't, I don't put that into my – I don't factor what high-frequency traders might be doing with regard to a position I might decide to either enter or exit. Um, I just try to take advantage of momentum. I try to take advantage of also where the, what the market has done on a historical basis um, and, and on a seasonal basis. You know, so, I mean, there's this, this so much involved in this. And this is, I think, why, by and large, most people – fail at this business because it involves so much work um, and so much research and, and understanding. Um, and, and again, this is the part where people, they don't tend to put in the time that's required. I mean, there's no such thing as, as just sitting down at your computer, making a trade and just forgetting about it. It's, it's impossible. You have to follow that trade. You have to see where it's going. You have to follow overseas markets, currency markets, bond markets, again, historical patterns, all kinds of things. So, you know, again, this goes back to the questions I get all the time from people like, you know, Greg, what should I do to get into this business? Well, I would just say start reading every single book you can think about or find uh, regarding this and, and really put your head in it. And, and, and you have to become this thing. What, whatever you decide to do in life, I don't care if, it's a, if you want to be a, a trader or you want to be a doctor or you want to be a lawyer or an Indian chief, you've got to become that thing. You have to literally become it. And, and that's the only way to succeed in anything that you want to do. And if, you, if people are willing to literally become that thing, then they'll be successful. If they're not willing to become whatever they, they're envisioning, they, they will fail, especially in this, in this business. And uh, that's a great point, Greg, and I think that's very important for our listeners out there who want to go find a good career is that not only do you have to work hard, you have to go find your passion and you have to outwork the other people uh, learning and adapting to uh, what you're trying to do. Without a doubt. Now, um, uh, 
in, in terms of technical analysis here, we'll, we'll relate it to gold and silver because Wall Street for Main Street uses technical analysis quite a bit too, like Mo said, for entry and exit points, for hedging and things like that. And it actually does seem to work really well in all the markets but gold and silver. What, why do you think gold and silver, it doesn't seem to work at all? <laughs> um, well, I, I, I think the um, that most of the people probably listening to this understand the environment that we're in here. Um, it's, it's not real. I, nothing is real. And that's what makes it, everything, even trading in this environment, so difficult. Um, we have a managed market. A, and not only do we have a managed market, we have manipulators of, of the metals that will go through any and all lengths to, to keep these prices suppressed. So this is the problem here um, regarding the technical side of that. But from a fundamental side, as you're well aware, you know, where should we all, where should we all be investing? Absolutely in precious metals, 100%. And that's a great point there. Um, yeah, we we stopped uh, looking at the chart for gold and silver we mentioned before uh, for the past year or so because it's just becoming hard to figure out when the gold and silver is going to take off. Every time it, it has a little momentum, it comes back down. And, and, and it, that, go ahead. Yeah, and the support level, I don't know if you noticed this, Greg, but on the charts, the support levels, it, and anytime there's a strong support level, it seems like at 3 a.m. Eastern time when everyone's asleep, Someone goes in and just blows up the market with a not-for-profit sell order. And, you know, I, as you know, as a trader, when you're trying to do a sell, right, you accumulate on weakness, right? As a contrarian trader, you tend to accumulate on weakness on support levels, and then you tend to, tend to sell into distributions, right, into strength. And the gold and silver charts just don't do any of those normal types of markets there where you see traders wanting to not rock the boat on a market and sell the, you know, sell a tiny portion of their positions into strength. That just doesn't happen in gold and silver. Uh, absolutely. And look at what happened recently with gold. Was it two weeks ago when we had that major drop where someone dumped 5,000 contracts onto the market with a market order? With in a market minute. order. In one minute. Yeah. Exactly. And now, what I want people to, to understand here is this would never happen. No one does this. Not, in, not an individual investor, an institutional investor. No one is going to dump that many shares of any asset onto the market with a market order. You're going to want to get the best price possible. Wouldn't that make sense to everyone listening? I would hope it would. So you're going to put it a limit order. You would never, never do this. And I don't think this is getting the attention that it should. This was a clear example, crystal clear, of, of, of a market manipulator out there, market manipulation that did this to drive the price down. It's unbelievable. I, I mean, when I saw this, my eyeballs almost popped out of my head. Uh, friends of mine who I was talking to, I was getting phone calls from people like, what is going on? This wouldn't happen. No like, one, mean, like mainstream people who normally wouldn't have even have noticed? Well, friends of mine that are traders and stuff, okay. they're, like, they're like, Greg, what the heck? They're like, this would never happen. I'm like, of course it would never happen. This is incredible. But then again, I ignore that whole thing. I really do. I don't care where the spot price is, what they want to do to it. doesn't matter. I just look at it as an, as an advantage to me because, you know, I've been buying more and more of this than I ever have as of late. And I will continue to do this because the long-term outlook here, as we all know, and I would imagine most of your listeners know, is we are entering a crisis of currency, the likes of which people are not going to believe as we move forward. And so the lesson for our people out there to take from this is just to stay away from the gold and silver chart for now. And I just keep buying uh, gold and silver at these levels. And try not to time the market because it's, it's pretty difficult right now. And stay out of the futures too. Stay out of the futures market with the leverage because that that five thousand contract trade that Greg mentioned, uh, our listeners. Normally that market, there's only one hundred fifty contracts traded around that time of day, and then the five thousand contract order just appeared. So it's it's just amazing, you know, that you see things like this uh, happen, and it's. You know, obviously, it's a not-for-profit seller, and they don't care uh, what happens to the price. Uh, it was obviously intentionally to drive the, uh, the the paper price down below the support level. 
That's exactly what I think it was. And you know what I did? I bought more physical gold when that happened. <laughs> I really did. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, seriously, just ignore these things. People ignore the paper price. It doesn't matter. Just look at what the world's central banks are doing. They're going to print and print and print. There's no ending to it. This is the new norm. Um, and, and, and you need to be in hard assets, period. Yeah. Yeah, and you correctly pointed out, Greg, that there there was not going to be a taper. So I, we we should definitely give you credit for that because I remember uh, we were on an interview together, I think, with Elijah uh, about a month ago, right? And you said there wasn't going to be a taper. And I know there was a lot of people, uh, mainstream people, who were like calling us names, saying there was going to be a taper, blah blah blah. And obviously, uh, look what happened. Jason, I got beat up by almost every. Every person that I know who's a trader as well, they all told me how wrong I was. They were like, Greg, you were wrong. You don't know what you're talking about, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, I started to actually go, wow, I must be wrong. How could everyone be telling me, everyone telling me that, you know, I'm making such a huge mistake here? And I started actually to get almost convinced that maybe yeah. I was wrong. They're all brainwashed Keynesians, though, my friend. They're all Keynes. They're all brainwashed Keynes. They're all Wall Street robots who have uh, – they're, they're very book smart. They probably got an A in school in their uh, macroeconomics class. They probably memorized uh, – they probably read Keynes' book and memorized it and got an A in it, but they don't question any of the stuff in there. It is all garbage. <laughs> I agree. There will be – I want to go on record again here saying there will be no taper ever. It's not ever going to happen. They will increase it at one point next year. They have to. They have no choice to keep the system propped up. Um, and then we – that's it. I mean, we're we're here. We're done with this. Uh, this is the new norm. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think they're gonna taper for a long time, and <laughs> I don't think they're gonna raise the interest rate for a while too. And Kyle Bass came out on on an interview and said the same thing that the Federal Reserve is not gonna taper or raise interest rate f uh, for a while. Uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I just have uh, one final question regarding technical analysis, sure. and then we'll go to the next subject. And talking about your uh, philosophy for, you know, reading charts other than for gold and silver, um, is there a, a pattern or is there a technical indicator that you you you, you like to use um, when you're looking at charts? Sure. I, I like to use uh, first of all uh, the candlestick uh, graphing. Um, I like to use the MACD. Um, I look at the ultimate oscillator relative strength. Um, I also use uh, Fibonacci retracements. Um, usually those are my standards that I go by, but I do bounce around from time to time as well. I'm always trying to evolve the system. Um, uh, on balance volume is another one people might want to look at. Um, what, what's your, are, sorry, yeah. Greg, it seems, it seems like you, you, um, you reweight your indicators, but what's your opinion of Elliott Wave? Because some people, you know, are kind of like religious and they love only Elliott Wave. But uh, some of the hedge fund people I've talked to are they think it's just, you know, one indicator, one tool in the toolbox, and it's completely hit or miss in a lot of uh, instances. The Elliott Wave, I, I do, you know, and I've taken some criticism for this, too, but I do believe in the Elliott Wave theory. Um, I don't I, I mean, look, none of this stuff is written in stone and none of it is right 100 percent of the time. People need to realize that. But I think if you learn to use this all of these tools that you put in your toolbox and on your own experience over over the years and time and study you'll find that you will be right if you're you know if you're again willing to put in the time about 70 percent of the time if you're right 70 percent of the time using the Elliott wave using the Fibonacci traces using technical analysis using fundamentals as well and putting this whole thing together you know, you will be way, way ahead of the curve over time. And you just got to have discipline and understand that not all of your trades, no matter what you do, are not going to be successful. Some will lose, period. You just got to have the fortitude to say, okay, this didn't work. This trade failed. I'm out of it. And you get out of it. You reallocate those funds someplace else. It's that, you know, it, it, I'm making, I'm oversimplifying it, but basically that's how this works. And if you can make this work for you 70, even six, out of 60 percent of the time, you're going to make money over time in this business. There's no doubt about it, but you got to have the discipline. You got to have the fortitude to understand that this isn't a business that's going to, you know, when that bell goes off on, on the New York Stock Exchange in the morning and then ends at night, that that's your, your beginning and end. You're going to be doing this 
all night long, and sometimes through the weekend. There, there's very little time off in this business when you're when you're really trying to make this work. And if you're not willing to do that, you shouldn't even get involved in this at all. And that's a great point there. Technical, I, th- I think technical analysis is more of an art. Uh, you, oh, it's, you're either, it definitely yeah. is an art. All of this is an art because you need, you got to put all this together as like a mosaic, like in your head. And, you know, you got to rely and you got to like rely on so many different things to come together. Again, I do rely a lot on technical analysis. I also like to rely on, on, on historical patterns as well. I think they are very, very important and, and they have proven to over time again, to be right. Now, it doesn't mean, you know, they're always going to be right again. It's just, but you can use the 7 out of 10 or 6 out of 10 gauge and as, as a standard and say that if I'm doing the job correctly, that's how many times, how many trades I will win, like 6 or 7 out of 10. And that's more than enough to put you on the winning side of this. And I agree with you there. And then let's shift gear here and go back and talk about uh, the Federal Reserve and the next upcoming Fed chairwoman, uh, Janet Yellen. Uh, from listening and reading and watching uh, her background and and her views on monetary policy, she seems to be a little bit more aggressive than Bernanke when it comes to money printing and QE and stimulus. Uh, do you think uh, Yellen will be will make Bernanke look like he's uh, a nobody when he, when she comes in? What do you expect from Yellen when she comes in as the chairman, chairwoman? I think that we're going to see things progress as they are. And again, next year, and I've been saying this for a while, the Fed will increase, not decrease quantitative easing. They will increase it, and they're going to come up with some reason why they need to do this. And, you know, I, I think the real question is, you know, the Fed's going to do what they're going to do, and, and that's it. We already understand, and, and I've been over this, that the, the, the 2008 crash, that was a party over moment. This is a side effect, a side effect that is terminal, and they know it. So they're going to keep printing and printing and buying assets to try to keep this propped up. This is how we know. I mean, we're five years status post-collapse of Lehman Brothers, five years out, and they're still printing like it happened yesterday. So we're, they're still in crisis mode. We are in crisis mode. This cannot end well. It will not end well. All the world's central banks have, are adopting the same policies now. Um, there's currency wars that are going on. Look at what's happened to the U.S. dollar, uh, now below a key technical uh, level. Um, it's, it's just not good here. And I think that brings us back to this. How long? Are, are, are those out there that are willing to hold on to bonds and willing to hold on to U.S. dollars going to be willing to hold them? When are they going to say enough is enough and just dump these things? Because we, bonds are earning negative returns. The dollar is getting literally melted. So at what, there's going to be a breaking point. And, you know, it may be sooner than later. And I know a lot of people like myself are talking about this. And there's no way to pinpoint this. There's no way. All you have to understand is this cannot go on forever. Yeah, and I think something that you touched on is really important there, and you said that they're eventually going to start dumping, but the problem is that everyone is dependent on everyone else, and you have a country like China, which needs to, they are transitioning to more of a consumer economy, but they're just getting more and more dollars and treasuries coming into their own economy from their trade surplus, and then Every time that, you know, their currency strengthens, it hurts their exports, and they're just in a stuck situation where they're damned if they do and damned if they don't. And then when the dollar, you know, almost went below that support level, like you said, uh, it looked like someone came in and started to manipulate the market to try to prop it back up. Maybe that was China coming in and buying treasuries because there was a recent news story out that China had been, you know, China's been dumping for months and uh, some other countries have been dumping for months. But I think China had to come in and start buying a lot in the last couple weeks just to save the dollar from going into free fall. Because, you know, they don't want a full dollar collapse. They want to manage the decline because then the value of all their paper holdings goes uh, almost instantly down 30, 40, or 50 percent. So this is all a disaster right now. Uh, We're in unprecedented territory here. Like you said, no one has ever printed. No central banks have all done this at once. I mean, there were currency wars, obviously, in the 20s uh, and 30s. But it, it was not to the level and, uh, 
you know, some of those got some of those countries were on gold standards and then they left gold standards and they were cheating on gold standards and stuff like that. So it's it's just amazing that we're it's all because of fiat currencies, though. It's it's just amazing. Absolutely. And I, I really believe this. that We are at the at the end game when it comes to this this scheme, this this money printing scheme where people are essentially working for nothing working for pieces of paper with numbers printed on it. There, there has to be a return to sound money. That's going to be the reset. And I'm telling you guys, when this thing really gets going, it's going to be the game changer of them all, of them all. Uh, do, do you think, Greg, that uh, they're going to be able to keep manipulating the stock and bond market and real estate markets higher? Or um, are they going to lose control of this at some point? Because it just seems to me like on the charts, like, Every time the stock market looks like it's about to break a key support level, that someone comes in and buys, like, spends $10 million on an S&P futures, humongous amounts of futures contracts, or they, the Fed says, you know, we're not going to taper, or we might even do more stimulus, and then the stock market just rebounds. You know, they're going to try to keep this going every which way they can and, and, and come up with things that – we haven't even thought of yet to try to keep this going here. But if you just look at this one basic fact, and that is this, if you look at what's going on here with, let's just say the United States economy and look at what's going on here with the stock market, anyone who has even a few functioning brain cells can see that there is an absolute disconnect here. So what does that mean? When assets rise above a level that, that economic growth and, and employment or well, whatever metric you want to use can can justify. You know we're in a bubble. So clearly, in my opinion at least, the equity markets are in a bubble. Bubbles can go on for a while, but when these bubbles burst, and they all burst, they rise above a level that can be sustained by any means. So we're, there is going to be that point where it cannot be sustained by any means, manipulation, money printing, asset purchases, whatever it is, it's going to burst. And that correction, when that, when that burst is going to, in, in my opinion, it's going to take 50% or more out of, of, the, out of the Dow, out of the S&P, right there. Um, and it's going, to, it's going to wipe out, literally wipe out, um, the investments of of millions upon millions of people, and people are going to be running around like chickens without heads, not knowing what to do. I want to also uh, look at the uh, legacy of Ben Bernanke and what he has done since he taken over at the Fed chairman. Uh, not only has he incorrectly told people that there is no housing bubble, he also went out and started a uh, the QE program, three of them, stimulus, uh, lending money or uh, printing money and giving it to the Euro uh, zone countries. So I was going to ask you, and I asked uh, my other guests uh, this question as well. What do you think 50 years or 100 years from now, what do you think the legacy of Ben Bernanke will be? Do you think people will hail him as a hero or do you think people will view him as a guy that did more harm than good. Sort of like FDR. A lot of people think FDR was a hero because he took us out of the Great Depression, mm. uh, even though his policy kind of made it worse. So uh, what's your opinion? You know, let, let me put a perspective on this. When when we had the crash of 2008, and you know, I, I'm, I'm going to admit here, I, I initially lost a lot of money. I, I, I kind of uh, was in the wrong spot there. And then when uh, Bernanke came out and announced the QE1, I really didn't view that as a bad thing. I thought, and, and I'm going to be honest, and I've taken a lot of heat for this as well, and I'm probably going to be saying this right now. I thought that was a good idea to do something. I felt something needed to be done. The system um, was, it became completely toxic. Um, and, and in a matter of a few weeks, uh, the, the, the landscape had changed so dramatically um, that, that, again, action needed to be taken to a certain degree. But I don't agree with all of the other – with the fact, I mean, that we're in this for five years still, as if Lehman Brothers collapsed yesterday. Um, I think the distortions that Ben, ben 
and the Federal Reserve in collusion. You have to understand this because this is this is a a partnership with our policymakers. Um, has created an, an environment where when when this whole thing plays out um, is going to leave a scar on on global and world history that people will never forget. Um, I, I think that the individuals involved in this will be known as probably the, um, I don't even know the word for it, um, th those that literally destroyed the world. Um, Bernanke's policy of, of, of printing cash out of thin air uh, to prop the system up um, as long as he has been doing this has done nothing but, but create asset distortions in, in every class. I, I think Jason would, and you would both agree. Mm -hmm. And there is going to be a moment without any doubt when, when all of this corrects to fair market value. And when that happens, people are going to, they're not going to believe it. It's going to be a moment in history that will never be forgotten. So with, it, with that perspective, you can say that the, the, um, the dastardly um, collaboration between the, the central banks of the world and the policymakers who have nothing but their own self-interests uh, in, in mind, they're going to go down in history as, as villains on, uh, on the same level as, as anyone you can possibly imagine that has caused destruction to mankind. Yeah, I think Mo, Mo and Gray, I don't know if you guys agree with this, but I mean, Greenspan started this whole mess, and then Bernanke inherited, obviously, a mess, but he made it even worse. He doubled down, and then Yellen is going to come in, and she's going to probably double down even more than that. She's going to increase things. So, I mean, these people, like, they all do almost the exact same thing. Only Greenspan really knows better, uh, or at least he's the one that's read all the Ayn Rand and Austrian School of Economics, because he's actually published in journals about the importance of a gold standard and sound money and not inflating and devalu inflating the money supply and devaluing the currency. But it's, it's just really amazing that these people just keep doing the same policy of, like, nominal asset price inflation to try to, you know, get the real economy going. It's only helping the really rich and well-connected and the government stuff for tax receipts. It's not really helping Main Street. And then my worst fear is that when this all does hit the fan – and there is a legitimate currency crisis and a bond market crisis because I think the worst problems are going to come from the bond markets and the currency markets. Uh, they're going to blame capitalism and free markets, and they're going to try to put – uh, they're going to try to tax us all humongously more. They're going to try to put humongous amounts of rules and regulations about starting a new business and things like that. And it's, it's, you're not going to have freedoms anymore because we're already starting to see a humongous loss of freedoms uh, in terms of capital controls, uh, spying, and all these other things. I agree. I absolutely do agree with you. And they're all going to try to blame it on uh, on the free market. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to keep that. We don't have a free market. We, we all know it. We know that. This is a managed market. And that comes back to the ideology. What do we want as Americans? Do we want a, a government that is so big and so monstrous that it can force you to buy things? I'm referring to Obamacare here. Or, or, and do we want a managed market where a Federal Reserve can manipulate interest rates, manipulate currency, and everything else in between? Or do we want a smaller government that gives, a, gives us our freedom and a, and, and, and a free market economy? I mean, that's what made America great, is a free market. And we're losing it all. We're watching it go up in smoke right before our eyes. And I think that's the divide here in America is there are those on one side of the equation that want socialism. There are the others on the other side of the equation that want a free market. And you can't have both. You cannot have both. History has proven that. Well, I'm, ho I'm hoping for more free market down the road uh, <laughs> instead of more managed markets. But uh, with the trend that's going on around the world, it seems to be more demand for managed market, except when it comes, especially when it comes to living wages. A lot of people are supporting twenty-two dollars minimum wage, eleven dollars minimum wage, which is going to do more harm than good when it's in implemented, Absolutely. because people are not thinking about the unintended consequences of something that might be a good idea. But in reality, it does more harm than good. Yeah, in th only in, th in theory it looks like a good idea, and then when it goes into the real world, it just becomes a failure. France already tried a lot of these policies 
where they try to raise everyone's uh, wages, and then a lot of the uh, workers just got replaced with computers and robots <laughs> and touchscreens. <laughs> and then all, uh, I'm sorry. And then in, in Washington D.C., uh, they I think they pa they passed a bill where all the big retailers are required to pay their employees at least fifteen dollars per hour. And in result, Walmart decided to uh, abandon plan to open up more stores than D.C. So those exactly. people that need a job are not going to get any jobs at all now. Exactly. They don't think – and just that just goes back to everything else. No one thinks about the, the – the, again, the unintended consequences that are going to evolve from all of this. I can't imagine how people can sit back and watch what's going on. First of all, most people – you know, and I always say this. The zombie apocalypse is real, meaning that most people walk around in, in, in some kind of a state where they, they barely know what, what's going on in, in their own lives. Forget about what's going on in their government or with, what's happening on, with money. They're, they're like they're, they're zombified. And, and, and I think that is, uh, you know, unfortunately, the plague of, of <laughs> again, I'm going to take some heat for this probably too, but of the American people. The American people, unfortunately, in my opinion, have been dumbed down to such a degree that they literally can't walk and chew gum at the same time. And it's, it's, it's the policy of, of um, I guess you could say, our, our, our leaders to keep people in that dumbed down state. They can't have people have the ability to think. If they did, things would be much different. And I agree with you there. Well, Greg, thank you for coming on for podcast again. Uh, and people want to find more about what you do. Where can they go? Oh, um, I'm kind of everywhere. It's easy to get me uh, YouTube, uh, GregoryManarino.com, TradersChoice.net. Um, friend me on Facebook. Please follow me on Twitter. Um, it, it, I'm a pretty easy guy to find. Okay, great. Well, thank you for coming on, and hopefully you can come back on again in the future. Oh, I would love to. Thank you very much for having me.